Welcome back to our lecture series in engineering mechanics. Today our goal is to talk about forces in 3D spaces so that we can analyze systems as they exist in the real world. And to discuss 3D force systems it is best to recall some vector calculus so that we have the proper tools available for our analysis. So my first goal today is to define a proper description in 3D spaces. That includes things like the coordinate system and how do we express vectors in 3D. Then I want to talk about something very important to follow the rules in these analysis types, which is the directional cosine angles and their identity. That will come in very handy when we solve problems in 3Ds for force additions and such. And of course our ultimate goal is to be able to calculate the resultant forces in 3D systems and specifically also identify their directional angles. And my experience is that engineering mechanics students are often initially afraid of 3D force analyses, but you will see throughout this lecture and throughout the following upcoming lectures that it is actually not much different from what you have learned before, or at least it's not very difficult. So let's start by defining a proper right-handed coordinate system. And a right-handed coordinate system I will usually write as right handed coordinate system. And I believe that we all learned one method or another before in high school or anywhere else to identify right-handed coordinate systems. Some of them I find more complicated than others and some of them actually are very difficult to follow if it comes to more complicated or strangely arranged coordinate systems. So let me just talk about one of those methods um, just as a placeholder before I introduce the right-handed system that I like to think of when I solve these problems. So most students probably use their right arm and when they extend it, that one becomes the y-axis. And then the index finger is extended or curled in. Right, so this is curled in and therefore it becomes the x-axis. And then the thumb is pointed upwards and it becomes the positive z-axis. In fact, all of these are positive. That's what the definition is in that case. And maybe you used that method or maybe you used only the fingers. Some people point the finger, the index finger away and then use the other fingers to curl, which is the XY coordinate system. And then the thumb becomes the coordinate axis in the Z direction. However, I believe that this can be difficult sometimes. So I prefer what's called the right hand rule or the corkscrew rule. And let's just randomly draw a few coordinate system so that we can play with that rule. So first I draw an in-plane coordinate system and let me do that two times. So here is a familiar two-dimensional coordinate systems, uh, system and now I need to clearly state that if I draw a diagonal line downwards that means that this axis is coming towards you or is coming out of the plane whereas if I draw it diagonally upwards then it moves into the plane. So now let me make a quick copy of these so that I can create a few coordinate systems. So here I have that again and one more and now we have some coordinate systems to play with. In fact, let me now randomly assign letters to them just to identify some coordinate directions and I'm doing this truly random. I haven't thought this through right now so I want to identify later on myself which one of these directions could be a positive x, y, z coordinate system. So now I have them all marked up. 
And now let's talk about the proper mathematical definition. So the proper mathematical definition states that if you rotate the positive x-axis toward the positive y-axis, you have a positive rotation and the right-handed rule means that you now rotate into the positive z-direction. So rotation into positive z-direction. So let me explain that in a few more words because it's of course not clear what the rotation here means and I call that the bottle cap rule. So when you place your bottle, your soda bottle in the xy plane and you rot the, rotate the cap from the positive x to the positive y, then you would rotate in this case here, as it appears to us right now, clockwise. Of course, in 3D, clockwise and counterclockwise is always a difficult concept because it really depends on from which direction you look at the system. But you understand here that I'm looking down onto this plane and now I'm rotating from X to Y. And therefore, my bottle cap, if you want to place this on here, the soda bottle, my bottle cap would actually move into the plane. So this would not be a right-handed coordinate system. In fact, I can cross that out right now. That is not a right-handed coordinate system. Now let's continue that and let's look at this system which is actually similar to this one except the positive z direction now points into the plane so you already know that it is a positive right-handed coordinate system but just to reiterate it you rotate from positive x to positive y and you move into the plane so i can give that a check mark there we have it let's continue with our next one so now it becomes a little bit tricky because now I cannot put the bottle into this plane. However, I can imagine that I can put my bottle into this system and now I would rotate the bottle from positive X to positive Y. What would happen? So this could be like my tabletop. I place my bottle on it and I rotate from positive X to positive Y and my bottle cap would definitely move downwards. So this would not be a right-handed coordinate system once again. So we can cross that out. Now let's look at the one next to it. So here it's almost oh, randomly it's the same as this one, just in the opposite direction. So I rotate from positive x to positive y. And if I do that in this case, if my bottle stands here in this system, and maybe for those who still don't follow this rule, what I'm saying is like, here is my bottle and if I rotate the bottle cap from the positive x to the positive y, so I would rotate this way around, right? If I look at it from the top, then I would definitely open the bottle. And so therefore this once again is a right-handed coordinate system. Now let's see if I'm as lucky on my coordinate systems down here. So in this case, you would see that the bottle actually sits in that plane, in the xy plane, and then if I rotate it from x to y, the bottle cap would come towards us. So therefore, this actually happens to be a right-handed coordinate system. Last but not least, let's look at this one. Where would be my bottle? Now it's exactly the same, totally random. I didn't plan this, I promise. It's actually the opposite of this one. So I put my bottle in this plane again and I rotate from positive x to positive y the bottle cap would come out of the plane so therefore this is not a right-handed coordinate system so we can cross that out and this is truly a fail-safe method in all scenarios it will always work that's why mathematicians really define it this way and I recommend that you study this and follow this rule rather than the rule that we used to use in, co in high school or that we learned somewhere else because that can really become complicated if the system doesn't look like the system in your textbook. In fact, out of textbooks, you're probably familiar with the generic coordinate system, which looks mostly like this. The often teachers use X, Y, because that's what students are used to. And then they make this the Z direction. And you will see that sometimes. 
However, in this class, what we will use most often is the XY plane as the bottom, if you want to call it, as the floor. So I'm going to put the floor in here for you. So this would be X and this would be Y. And then this would be the positive Z axis. This is what we usually use in this class. Um, this, of course, is no different from each other. In fact, a lot of mathematicians prefer this because it's just an extension of the standard 2D coordinate system. But this here I prefer because the z-axis is the vertical axis, which is often the case in physical systems. And so this is what we're going to use in this class. And just one last time, if I rotate from x to y, my bottle stands in this plane, then I rotate this way and my bottle cap moves up which again is an important thing to memorize, not just for today's lecture, but also for future lectures where we're actually dealing with the cross product. And if you follow this method, you will easily identify the cross product in many scenarios because the cross product is literally defined by the right hand rule and by a right handed coordinate system. So hopefully this will prepare you properly for that. And now we are ready to move on and define how vectors are described in such a 3D coordinate system. So here we see a standard three-dimensional coordinate system and we now want to find out what is the notation for such systems. And as you see here, as I promised, the x-axis is coming towards you, if you will, and the y and the z-axis are in plane in this case. And now I need to define these vectors here. So you see the vector A that has component AY, AX and AZ. And of course, you probably already imagine or already predict that we first have to introduce our base vectors, which now, of course, we have three of them. So let me include those for you because we need that for our proper vector description. So here we have i hat, we have j hat, and now we have also k hat. And those are the 3D base vectors that you need to describe your coordinate system. In fact, let's write that down real quick. So i hat, j hat, and k hat are the base vectors in 3D. And that means that they really are base vectors with a unit length of one. And that they are mutually perpendicular to each other. So let's understand the mutually perpendicular. Of course, you take this for given, but it's very important that we understand that i is not just perpendicular to j, it's also perpendicular to k. Otherwise, we would not have a Cartesian coordinate system. So, Cartesian And you may take this for granted or you probably used to this all the time, but it is important to understand that it's mutually perpendicular so that we can now define our vector, this vector A in 3D space. In fact, let's do that next. So now I wanna look at vector A. So A is a vector and that now is described as you guessed it, AX times I hat plus AY times J hat plus AZ times K hat. And that, of course, usually has a unit. It could be length or it could be a force. We're not worried about this right now, but this is the definition of our vector in 3D space now. And just as before, you can now calculate its magnitude by finding the square of each of the components and then taking the square root of the sum of those. So let's write that down because that is always part of the answer that you will give in this class. So please understand that this is nothing else than Pythagorean theorem in 3D. And sometimes I have to convince students that this really works. But if you want to convince yourself, all you have to do is take AX squared plus AY squared. And what will you find? You will find this diagonal. In fact, that will become very important to today's lecture when we solve problems. But you find this diagonal. And then if you take this diagonal squared plus this value squared, you will find 
this length. So that's why this formula here works. You can always use Pythagorean in 3D because these components together are nothing else than the diagonal in this bottom triangle, if you will, right? So this triangle here. Now you may ask yourself, hmm, this is interesting. We have two answers now, which this is the component form and this is the magnitude, but usually we have to find three answers for every vector problem. And that is definitely also true for 3D notation, except remember what our third answer was. The third answer was always an angle. And so how do we do that in 3D? That's the next question that we have to ask ourselves. Because now we are dealing with a force that is acting in 3D here. And therefore angles are actually differently defined. So it's not just the sine, cosine and so on. We cannot do this with like our standard basic math, let's say. I mean, we will stay with basic math, but we'll have to look at it and interpret these angles differently. The best way to show you one angle in this picture here is by drawing this angle from A to the y-axis. So there's an angle which I have some more beautiful pictures for you, but this angle is usually called beta. So beta is not randomly defined, it's actually the angle between the j-axis and the vector a. So this is not random. This is only called beta, that angle, if it acts between the y-axis or the j-axis and that force or that distance, whatever vector you're going to use here. And that is the correct definition of the angle beta, which often is incorrectly interpreted. Students initially stand, tend to project this here onto the x y plane or in this case onto the y z plane and then they think that beta is acting in that direction but to prevent that confusion in the future we have these pretty pictures here on the side so let's take a look at this beta definition here because that's the easiest one to see in the 3d space and notice that this triangle here this is shaded for you is existent between the y-axis the force or the vector and then a right angled triangle in that plane. So think of this as a kite that you stitch or like a sail that you stitch to the y-axis and to the force or the vector. And within that plane, you find the beta value. So only in that plane, you actually have the beta value. And it is important to understand that there's the 90 degree angle. And we did everything we could to explain that to you properly so that you see here the box that is described by the AY, AX and AZ and so on. But of course, only here AY is shown because that's relevant for beta. Now we can move on and maybe take a look at gamma before we look uh, at alpha. Because again, this is easier to see in a 3D description in this type of coordinate system. So look, you have the box again here, right? And that box has a diagonal that is described by A and it has a height, in this case, AZ. And now if you stitch your kite or your sail to the Z axis and to the vector, then you find angle gamma. And gamma is always located between the actual vector, a vector, and now the k hat axis. So please keep in mind that you have k hat here, and that is what defines that particular angle. And you cannot call any other angle gamma. It's defined like this. So now let's move on to angle alpha. And yes, you guessed it, angle alpha, of course, is described by everything between the i hat axis and the actual vector in this case. So within that plane, we find that angle alpha. And again, that's not random. And notice that technically, although it's difficult to see here, you do have a 90 degree angle 
down here because this line that you see on the front of this box is actually connecting this corner to this corner and since the box has a right angle to this axis that's how that is defined. So now we have a solid understanding of what these angles are and where they are situated. So let's go back to our angle beta and let's define how we can actually calculate those. And if you have a solid understanding of trigonometry or the basic functions, you probably already see how that is done because of this 90 degree angle here. So this is a 90 degree triangle. And in a 90 degree triangle, you can always project the hypotenuse on to the adjacent using cosine. So in other words, I can say that A, the magnitude, times the cosine of beta is really equal to a y and that's also a magnitude technically so that is how you can calculate cosine beta and this is really where it comes from but you will find this formula in textbooks usually because you want to find beta as cosine beta being equal to a y the magnitude of that divided by the magnitude of the entire vector. And so that's why it's called the directional cosine or the directional cosine angle or the directional angles, people call this differently, but it's defined by this expression. And this is an expression you definitely want to memorize because it will come over and over again and you have to make proper use of it. Now let's see how this applies to one of our other angles. So let's take a look at angle gamma and gamma here in this case is situated here we see here's the hypotenuse here's the adjacent so same rules apply let's write that down so a magnitude times the cosine of gamma is really equal to a z and so in other words cosine gamma is equal to a z its magnitude divided by a magnitude once again it's an important formula to memorize so let's highlight it and you will see in a second why because we will use it and now we are ready to move on to our alpha angle and yes you guessed it we don't even have to derive it again because it's just the same concept the cosine of alpha is nothing else than a x magnitude divided by a magnitude and that is our last formula to memorize and it's so important because we can use it to describe our vectors which we will do now so my vector now can be really described as a being equal to a magnitude times cosine alpha i hat plus cosine beta j hat plus cosine gamma k hat and all i did here is i took these formulas and i pulled the common term out and then I used the cosine alpha to define all the x, y, z components. And of course, this is a vector. Now, ultimately, you need to describe your vector properly. As we said, we always use three types of answers. We need the components and the magnitude, and we need the angles, so alpha, beta and gamma and those are also our results so we double underline those and that really completes our answers for these three dimensional problems nevertheless sometimes you don't get there directly it is very difficult to get to this answer or to this answer because one of these angles are missing and then we can use a very important formula which is a trigonometric identity and that is something you 
also need to memorize. So let me just tell you that if you take cosine square alpha plus cosine square beta plus cosine square gamma, you will find that that is equal to one. And sometimes students come to me and tell me, hey, I do not have a cosine square button on my calculator, so I don't know what to do. So in that case, if you don't have that button, don't worry, you can always write it in a different form. You can say cosine alpha times cosine alpha, right? That is nothing else than cosine square, or some people prefer to write it as such, cosine beta, and then they square this, but mathematicians just call it cosine square, and in this case gamma, and again, that's equal to one. That is very important to memorize because it will help you in many cases to find all the important properties that may not be given in a real physical system. So for example, let's say you know this angle beta and you know the angle gamma, but you don't know the angle alpha, then you would need this formula to define the angle alpha first before you can even end up at these answers here because you would use this expression. And that is so important to understand that our next example problem will deal exactly with an expression and the use of these cosine identities or the trigonometric identities. But I believe now we have all the tools that we need to define a Cartesian vector in 3D according to the proper definition. So let's move on to our implementation of these problems.